Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here today, September 25th, 2017. This is our UNC Cancer Network North Carolina Community College Lecture. And uh, just a few preliminaries and then we'll get started. Uh, if you're having any trouble at all, you can email us at uncn at unc.edu or give us a call at 919-445-1000. Uh, we can address any technical issues, answer questions about the program, etc. at uh, either that email address or at that phone number. So uh, it, please, if something isn't, doesn't seem quite right with the presentation, call us up right away and let us see what we can do to help you out with that. Uh, we're going to use Poll Everywhere in just a minute, and that will give you a chance to ask questions uh, later on in the presentation and also uh, to respond to a poll at the beginning. Uh, you can find us on the web at unccn.org, and we've got all kinds of information about uh, previous lectures, uh, future lectures, our schedule, uh, our newsletter, and we'll also have a recording online of this presentation in just a day or so. All right, you can also find us on Facebook, you can find us on Twitter, and you can find us on YouTube. So lots of places to find out more about us. Uh, we are so pleased to be, this is, this is the first in a series of four for the 2017-2018 uh, academic year. These are lectures for community college students. So we are really pleased to have you here. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you also for community college faculty for participating in this. All right, so here, and I'm just going to uh, move our camera so that uh, we've got our, both myself and our, more, more importantly, our presenter. So this is Dr. Justin Yaw. Thank you so much Absolutely. for being here today. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. So, so I'm going to let them know uh, we've got a, a poll, and we're going to ask them to jump in in just a moment and respond to that poll. And the question is, what do you think are some of the psychosocial needs of patients experiencing cancer? So take a look at that, and I'll show you how to respond. You can do it one of two ways. You can go to pollev.com uh, forward slash UNCCN. You'll see the question there. You can respond. A lot of our listeners prefer to just use their phones. You can use a smartphone. You can use a phone that just has texting uh, capabilities. And what you do is one time you text the letters UNCCN to the number 22333. So you put in the number 22333, you'll put in the letters UNCCN, you'll hit send or go or whatever else. That You'll get a quick response back saying join. You only need to do that once all day today. Now you're joined to the poll, then you can go ahead and submit uh, your thoughts on this question, and we'll talk more about this in a minute. And uh, then we'll uh, go ahead and see what, what people think in terms of this. And uh, Dr. Yop, let me ask you, so psychosocial needs, what, what would you define as psychosocial needs? What is that, that term psychosocial? Yeah, so that's a, <clears throat> excuse me, that's a very large and kind of all-encompassing term, kind of an umbrella term that we would use for um, any kind of psychological um, any kind of, um, you know, kind of social, familial, any family relations uh, that may kind of go into this, financial um, needs uh, that cancer, in this, in this instance, a cancer patient may have. Um, it's a pretty broad and kind of all-encompassing, you know, basically what are the, the psychological, the social, the family support, the financial uh, needs of a, a cancer patient who's going through, obviously going through cancer treatment and going through all the other medical um, medical treatment as well. So largely these would be all of the things that fall outside of the medical needs. Pretty much. So yeah, so you're talking uh, psychologists like myself, mm -hmm. social workers, um, psychiatrists. Uh, we have, at least here we have a financial assistance coordinator, um, the massage therapist, even the nutritionist. Um, those are kind of all uh, jobs and occupations that we would considering that call that fall under the psychosocial need umbrella. Great, great. So you have some, some terms to work with there. So if you'll go ahead and, and uh, send those in, I'll go ahead and uh, finish our introductions here. So Dr. Justin Yop is a clinical psychologist and assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at UNC. He's a member of the UNC Comprehensive Cancer Support Program at the North Carolina Cancer Hospital where he provides inpatient as well as outpatient assessment and therapeutic services for children and adolescents with cancer. Dr. Yap also works with children whose parents have serious medical issues such as cancer. His research in the area is in the area of children's adaptation to cancer. 
Sounds pretty formal when you put it all in. It, it does. It sounds yeah, wow, impressive. Wow, wow, impressive. It sounds, it sounds okay. formal. And, and let, let me ask you about that last one. When you say children's adaptation to cancer, what? what what's well, a lot of the work that I do, I'm, mm -hmm. I split about half and half of my clinical work between seeing adults and working mm -hmm. in the pediatric oncology population. Okay. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, cancer is a uh, can strike at any age, and even though it's um, it's rare in children, uh, of course it does happen, and right. uh, UNC is one of the um, leaders certainly in this state of treating children and adolescents with cancer, so that's a lot of the work mm -hmm. I do. Okay. Um, and then with the adults that I see, um, kind of a specialized uh, niche that I work in is working with those adults who are parents uh, and have young children, um, so parents with cancer have young children at home and kind of the uh, added um, intricacies that come with that in terms of parenting with cancer. Understood. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, well, we have lots of, of responses. Let's take a look at some of these. Thank you so much for uh, all of those who responded and for responding so quickly. So stages of grief. Uh, we have spiritual comfort, fear of death, meal transportation, understanding of insurance, formalized friendships, yeah. social support, coping skills, strong family relationships, community relationships, Problem-solving skills. I don't think they need this presentation. No, they, they, <laughs> they, they got, got it. it. Yeah, <laughs> they got it. Um, yeah, we're seeing one there. It says fear of death, and mm -hmm. that's certainly true all the way down to you know fairly young children. When you hear the word cancer, it's different than hearing you know the word diabetes or something like that. It it, it doesn't mean that those aren't serious, but when you hear the word cancer, it's associated a lot of people associated with death or at least fear of death, um, and that's something whether or not we address it in. Uh, psychotherapy or not, it's usually at least touched on because otherwise it becomes the elephant in the room. So mm -hmm. um, certainly that fear of death kind of struck out to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the other ones, grief, depression, um, need of support, stages of grief, mm -hmm. uh, which I maybe mean, we can, it's not quite this talk, but uh, I have some, some thoughts on that. <laughs> we'll there, there that. Just, just like some of our audience is probably familiar with uh, Dr. Kubler-Ross, uh, stages of, of grief and dealing with death, it seems like, and with other presenters that I've talked with, there there are stages of coping with, with cancer. That um, may not be as formalized, but... There are, and even mm -hmm. this is a little bit of a side, but with the Kubler-Ross mm -hmm. model, mm -hmm. um, there's not been much research to support that mm -hmm. at all. In mm -hmm. fact, some of the research has um, kind of debunked it, but it's so, yeah. it's so ingrained in our... Uh, in our in our culture and in our mindset that these are the five stages that people progress through. Mm -hmm. um, it would be kind of nice if grief was that orderly and that kind of uh, universal in its in its uh, progression, but that's usually not, or that's really not the way it goes. Grief right. is much more than just those five emotions and much more than emotions in general. So um, we still talk about the five stages of grief, but uh, if you're interested, and this is not really, this is sure. talks about, but if you're interested, look up the dual process model of coping and bereavement. Um, it's a, a, a model that allows, allows for a much more kind of individualized look at grief, but, but also kind of adds some structure and understanding to what you're going through. So the dual process model is something that we, or that I prefer uh, much more than the stages of grief model. Good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks for all of those responses. Uh, now we're going to go into the presentation, and add, if you think of other questions, just go ahead and text those in, and then a, a page similar to what you're looking at here will pop up at the end, and we'll be able to take those questions. Well, Dr. Yap will be able to take those questions. <laughs> That's so, again, so. All right, so let me turn this over to you, so right. you can just use the arrows on the, on the bottom the right there, right okay. and then uh, if you want to use the mouse as a cursor at all, you've, you've got that available to you as well. All right, thank you. All right, so we did the introduction. That was uh, sounding so formal. Justin Yap, um, in addition to my academic um, rank here at the, at the university, I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist, so that's, that's my profession, that's what I do, and you know, to be a uh, to provide psychosocial care to cancer patients, you know, like I mentioned before, it comes from psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, lots of us. Um, my role, just for what it's worth, here is a psychologist. So there's that quick outline of what we're going to be going through, and uh, a pretty brief, brief, excuse me, background, uh, quick kind of definition of what is psycho oncology, um, why cancer is so hard, which I'm sure many of you can imagine, either through having family or or friends who have gone through cancer, um, 
some common psychological issues, coping strategies, and therapeutic approaches that we use with the people we meet with. So real quick in the way of kind of background on cancer in general, taking out the psychosocial aspect of it, uh, you see there listed the most common types of cancer, both lung uh, and colorectal are common for men and women, and then you see prostate for men, breast for women. Um, thankfully, cancer mortality has been decreasing for the last 20 or so years. Um, that's the good news. The, the bad news is, is that uh, there's still a lot of it out there. And as you see, there's 13 million cancer survivors in this country alone and about a million new cases, a million and a half new cases each year uh, in our country and in our state. Uh, we're looking at about 50,000. Um, so it is, it is unfortunately uh, something that's been studied and certainly, you know, the researchers are all over it, but it's not something that we've uh, got a great handle on yet in terms of uh, either preventing it or curing it. All right, so in terms of psycho-oncology, uh, cancer used to be very stigmatized, and you saw this in the way that um, the doctors, physicians back then talked to their patients that uh, it was not always, inf they were not always informed they had cancer, especially for kids, um, because it was so stigmatized because of its association with death. Um, thankfully, that's changed, and I'm not old enough to remember when that, when that, was, the, uh, when that was the feel of the, of, the, of the industry, but it's not now. Um, Dr. Jimmy Holland was the, she's a psychiatrist up at Sloan Kettering in New York, and she was the first one to start a psycho-oncology service in, uh, back in the 70s, and really kind of is considered the grandmother of psycho-oncology, um, and is still a, a luminary in the field. Um, you see there at the very bottom is an important one. The Institute on Medicine uh, released a, a report about 10 years ago in which it really emphasized and even mandated uh, the psychosocial needs of patients be integrated into their care. Um, and so something I think we all kind of can know and appreciate, but this puts some, uh, puts some muscle behind that, and that's not that we're just treating a disease, but we're treating the person. And with that person uh, comes all the psychosocial needs, some of which you guys had, uh, had texted in on, the, on that list and uh, did a great job with that. All right, so the psycho-oncologist. psycho, psycho can include, you know, a bunch of different, uh, you know, specific professions, but basically someone who is providing psychological, emotional support uh, for people going through uh, cancer, either people who've been diagnosed, going through treatment, or even into survivorship. Um, as you can imagine, it addresses the emotional reaction to cancer for the patient. Uh, and more than that, it also works with caregivers, um, certainly spouses, children, uh, parents, and as well as the staff here at the hospital, um, you know, we all um, work as a team and, and we're all affected as a team. We get to know these patients and so the psycho-oncologist, such as myself, sometimes works with, or at least talks with, uh, other oncologists, other staff members about what it's like to, to treat this population. Um, so you see there's psychotherapy at the very bottom. That's uh, a lot of what I do as a psychologist. Um, so there's a whole other piece of this that could get into the medications that are used to treat depression or anxiety, and I could only talk about that a little bit. That's not, um, I don't prescribe, and that's, that's not my area, so that, I'll spare you the, my uh, rudimentary knowledge on that today. All right, so relevant medical issues, right? So we're, this is not, you know, this is very different than, say, seeing a psychologist or a counselor in the community, which you go in for because you have some, you know, specific issue or concern or diagnosis that you, that you need to uh, learn more about it and get a handle on. Uh, the ticket in the door to see us, to see me at least, um, is a cancer diagnosis, right? So just that in of itself, no matter, you know, kind of how healthy you are psychologically or how good your social situation is, can certainly bring up a lot of issues. Um, and so when working with patients, of course, you have to know kind of where they are in their medical treatment and kind of what some of the issues are. You see there, the illness-specific issues, and that CNS is the central nervous system. So if you have a uh, patient who has a brain tumor, certainly um, having a knowledge of that, knowing where the tumor is, and knowing how that affects their behavior or emotional regulation or speech, um, certainly a big part of that. And then the treatment side effects, um, as it says there at the bottom, you know, the cure can sometimes be worse than the disease. In fact, we have sometimes that I'll meet with people who come in and get diagnosed um, with really being almost asymptomatic, if not sometimes completely asymptomatic. So you think they come into the hospital feeling okay and not feeling bad, 
but then they start treatment and go through treatment and almost to a person feel worse. Um, just a quick aside, you can imagine what that's like as a child. If you come into a place and you feel okay, and then they make you feel bad and you leave the hospital feeling worse, kind of what your association can be with the hospital and whether or not you think that these doctors are making you feel bad. And even if you're not a kid and old enough to understand the dynamics, um, still, a lot of side effects you see there from surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, kind of the three main arms of how we treat cancer. And then bone marrow transplant, which is kind of a whole different animal um, and kind of what that can entail. But um, medical issues and how that affects the, uh, the person and their psychological response going through their treatment certainly is obviously a big part of this. So when we look at kind of my, my job and when, when I work with patients most is typically when they're most vulnerable. And there's a couple of peaks in vulnerability, if you will, and that is at diagnosis and then if recurrence happens and the cancer comes back. So you can think of at diagnosis, of course, you're um, you know, kind of living your life and then all of a sudden cancer is thrown in your face and you're fearing death and fearing kind of what your life is going to look like and all the other issues that come with it. And so just kind of digesting and absorbing that news and making sense of a whole new medical lexicon that you feel like you have to know and find child care for your kids because you have to be up here and what you, and just everything that that can feel overwhelming and new at the beginning of the diagnosis and then I, I would say typically and that's really not for everyone but typically once you kind of get your feet under you and you start getting through treatment and you start to know the doctors and you know the medicine side effects and you've had a little time for it to absorb and you kind of start to get into the rhythm of treatment, often kind of the, uh, the acuity of psychiatric issues can, can ebb there overall, certainly not for everyone. Um, and then if the cancer treatment goes well and you transition into survivorship and you're finished with your active treatment, that's obviously reason for, ce reason for celebration. It's also a reason, or can be a reason for a little spike in anxiety because when you're going through treatment and you kind of feel like you have the comfort, even though you may hate how the chemotherapy feels or you may hate, uh, you know, the, the, the fear that goes with, with having cancer, at least you know you're attacking the cancer and you're doing something about it. Uh, when you're off that treatment and you go into survivorship, sometimes people can feel a little anxiety as if they're not treating it and that kind of security blank, even though they hated it, uh, is gone. Um, the other peak there, number two, is recurrence, and um, you can imagine why that would be, right? You go through your cancer treatment, um, hopefully you've achieved remission, you're going through, you start to have some hopes, or I think you're uh, maybe clear of this, and then the cancer comes back. And that is a, uh, you know, a day that's devastating for nearly everyone. Um, now, there's different levels of recurrence. Sometimes the recurrence comes back, and or the recurrence occurs, and the cancer comes back, and there really is nothing to do about that anymore, and that's a whole different area, but sometimes there's certainly second, third, and fourth line treatments to do, but um, each time you fail a treatment or each time the cancer comes back is, is certainly a blow. Um, and then it's not listed up there, but if we get to the point where uh, treatment is not working and there are no treatments either available or none that the patient is willing to try for maybe the small, small hope of cure, life prolongation, then there's the end of life. Um, and as we can imagine, and we'll talk about it in a minute, there's a lot of, a lot of obviously psychological and familial issues that go with end of life. All right, now I've been talking straight for a while. Are we good, or do you want to do you want to chime in there? Uh, well, that, yeah, no, I, I, this is great. I, one thing that that I think is interesting is that whole piece in terms of after even phases of treatment, and I've seen this with a with a close family member where there was a surprise that, that that person was so focused on a certain phase, a certain area of maybe chemotherapy, and then getting to the end of that and not expecting that spike. So, and, and so that's typical, huh? Yeah. You know, there's spikes after chemo or after surgery or after radiation, maybe. Yeah, and even at, yeah, mm -hmm. after you're done with your treatment, mm -hmm. we actually have a program here called Cancer Transitions, mm -hmm. which is to help you transition into survivorship. Mm -hmm. um, just because being done with treatment doesn't mean that, you know, you've erased that from your memory or that it's not still an issue um, you know, that 
that you're going through and being a survivor of cancer, um, some people kind of embrace that mm -hmm. um, and kind of wear it as a, as a badge of honor that they want people to know and they mm -hmm. kind of make that as a part of their identity. And some people want to put cancer behind them as much as possible and don't want to talk about it and don't want to be labeled a survivor and don't want to kind of do, they just need to get past it. And there's no right or wrong, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly when you transition to survivorship, that can be a um, you know, kind of a decision point as to how you want to view your cancer in the rear view mirror because it doesn't always feel like it's in the rear view mirror. Right. And I would assume that the different types of cancer might, with uh, each with its own different prognosis, might influence how, if somebody knows that they have a window of a certain number of months or years yeah, to get through before, before you know, they're... That's, they're uh, yeah, that's a good point. So if you finish treatment mm -hmm. and, you know, the doctors are able to tell you that they feel very confident that you're, um, that it won't come back or they mm -hmm. at least have reason to think that, then that can give you one level of maybe security. But mm -hmm. sometimes there is, you know, you're done with active treatment, but that doesn't mean that the cancer is... Uh, is, is gone forever and in some situations there's a high likelihood that it will come back and that can be kind of a tough limbo time yeah. um, when you're not doing anything for a problem that you can expect to arise again even though there's nothing to do about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a tough time. And, and uh, tell me if I'm jumping the gun in terms of, because you may be talking about this uh, further on, but, but what are the sorts of things that a patient might do in that, in, in that scenario uh, that can be proactive? Because I'm, I'm guessing that being proactive, doing something, <laughs> has, has got to uh, have, have certain benefits. Yeah, and it, certainly. I think we're going to get to that, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a little bit. But yeah, there's certainly... You know, sometimes people wish to meet with a counselor or psychologist mm -hmm. to kind of get straight with that. Certainly people can join our transitions program, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of a, a, just to help you do just that transition from one to the other. Okay. Um, certainly getting back to life as normal um, mm -hmm. can be stressful and can not, maybe not always be possible, but uh, back into work, back to doing things that make you you. Mm -hmm. um, it, but it's it's tough. Sometimes people feel like once they've had kind of cancer, that kind of is part of their identity, and um, whether they want to shut it or not, it's kind of who they are, okay. part of who they are. All right, so let's. I have this up here, just as a quick. I'm not. I'm, I borrowed this from a colleague, so I'm not even quite sure the citation for this, but just to put that up there, just so you kind of can see that a lot of people respond, you know, what we would call normally or respond without any psychiatric issues, and that's really. I would even say probably even more than 50%. That doesn't mean that 50% don't have some kind of response or some kind of, you know, you know, angst going through their cancer treatment, but not to the point where it rises to a psychiatric disorder. And you see the other part is mixed between either someone has a, a mood disorder, which you know, we think of major depressive disorder, depression, or an adjustment disorder, which is, uh, can be that. It can either, it's usually a little bit lighter. Um, in terms of depressive symptoms or anxiety symptoms um, or emotional regulation, both in terms of intensity and frequency, and are really related to adjusting to having um, either having cancer or having had cancer. Um, all right, so common psychiatric syndromes. Again, we just went over adjustment disorders. That's that's really even though it. On that last slide, it looked like it was just a little bit more than, uh, say, a mood disorder. I, in my experience, it's it's more than that. It's that people, you know, a week before I met them or a week before they were diagnosed, uh, wouldn't have qualified for any psychiatric disorder, um, and then you know they had symptoms of depression or anxiety, um, and usually that's within the context of adjusting to their new life circumstances. Now, that doesn't mean that just because they're adjusting to those circumstances doesn't mean that, that it also can't rise to the level of uh, either major depressive disorder or an actual anxiety disorder. Um, but I, at least in my experience, in my judgment, that usually doesn't happen, that it reaches that level, um, at least not for a lot of people. Uh, you see there, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's actually not as common as, as kind of was once suspected, uh, but certainly this is a traumatic experience for a lot of people. And... Uh, either, you know, kind of once you're past that traumatic experience, uh, either, you know, kind of having some residual um, anxiety or feeling kind of on alert or feeling like you have to look over your shoulder or kind of having nightmares or easily aroused, 
Um, sometimes that rises to the level of uh, a di diagnosis there. Um, you see there at the bottom, those uh, cognitive impairment, delirium. Delirium's a, a little bit outside of the scope of this talk, but that's uh, more prevalent in the inpatients than we had probably originally assumed. But for most people, that is kind of a, a quick and hopefully transient state. Um, all right, so what are some of the kind of common psychological issues that these you know, patients go through? You see there on the top is autonomy versus dependence. And this is a hard one for most people. Um, I think I can say this as a, as a guy. It's a little harder for men, uh, at least in my experience. Um, you know, you're kind of going through your life, you're, say, working your job, you're doing your own thing, <clears throat> you know, you feel like you are you are autonomous, and then either because of your illness or because of the side effects of your treatment, you're suddenly more dependent on others, whether that's dependent on others for financial support, whether it's dependent on others to do things around the house, whether it's dependent on others to help you get up out of a chair or use the bathroom, um, you know, make dinner, get you, all these kind of things that, um, you know, you haven't needed to depend on people for years or decades, uh, suddenly you are. And that's a, for a lot of people, that's a big transition. And if you're someone who is used to being on the go and you say you had a job and that job was a big part of your identity, depending on your cancer and your cancer treatment, sometimes you'll have to, you know, take time off from that job, sometimes for an extended period of time. Um, and to not feel like you are kind of leading the ship in your household or kind of controlling your own destiny, but that you are dependent on others for assistance and support uh, can be a real ego blow for a lot of people. Um, next one there, denial and hope. Um, hope, right? That's kind of a lot of what it comes down to, I think, for a lot of people, at least that I've worked with, is can you find hope in your situation? And thankfully, for most cancers, there's... Uh, there's a lot of hope to have, right? Um, you know, most of them can be treated. Most of them can be, you know, can be, um, you know, cured in a sense. But um, maintaining that hope while not denying the reality of what's going on, it, it seems like two ends of the, of the same spectrum, but it's really, I think there's kind of a sweet spot there in the middle where you can accept and understand and acknowledge that, you know, you have an illness and that it may be a very serious illness and it may be a life-threatening illness but then still have hope that you can, you know, beat that illness and return to a life that feels normal again. Um, both those things can happen, but sometimes I think there's a tendency to either, you know, kind of try and be overly hopeful and just kind of, you know, la, 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 kind of deny or, you know, really kind of have your mind fixated on the what ifs. Um, and I think everyone does a little bit of that, but I think, um, you know, if you can kind of balance those and find the sweet spot in the middle, then from what I see, that's usually when people do the best. Um, body image, you know, most people know that, you know, you lose your hair with a lot of different types of cancer. Um, and that's a big deal. A lot of times you get steroids, which can make you puffier, uh, kind of give you uh, a little cushionoid face. Uh, depending on if you had surgery, where you may have scars, if you have breast cancer, having, uh, you know, a, a mastectomy. There's a lot of body image issues and body disfigurement that can be, depending on your cancer and your treatment, can be associated um, and is often the target of the work that I do. Um, guilt. It's, I, I think when I started doing this, I, if I would have guessed at that point how many times, how often people feel guilty during their cancer treatment, I would have underestimated it. I see it a lot. And it's not so much guilt that I brought this on myself, although there is some of that. Um, even when people can realize that it's completely unfounded, there's nothing you did to bring on, say, prostate cancer or breast cancer, um, you know, still you feel like you should have or could have done something. Uh, but it's, it's, it's also guilt for inconveniencing others in your life. I hear this, I, it's almost, I should just kind of put it on a, a placard and show it to couples. It's almost always where the ill spouse, a married couple, the ill spouse feels like he or she is a burden, feels like he or she is putting out the whole family, both financially and time-wise, and really feels guilty for everyone else having to suffer for their own suffering. And then the well spouse, the healthy one, will 
always say, quit it, you're being ridiculous, that's silly, this is where I want to be, you know, kind of married, married to you, this is kind of what we do. And whether it's man, woman, woman, man, woman, woman, man, man, that is really what I see um, a lot is, is a guilt for putting the family out or putting your loved ones out. And then the other side, you know, really believing that it, it's not a burden. That's not how people, it's not how healthy spouses say, see it. Uh, family adjustment, that's kind of a big category there. But um, I mentioned earlier that I work a lot with parents with cancer and who have young children at home. And uh, certainly that's a big issue when you have to explain to your children your illness. And if they're old enough, you know, touch on your prognosis if you choose to. Um, and then, it's, of course, making family adjustments and kind of the logistical needs of just kind of figuring out how to deal with this big wrench in your life. Uh, and financial, the last one, um, that's a big one, right? Cancer, not just the medical bills, which, as we know, can uh, bankrupt a lot of people. And depending on where health care in this country goes, could bankrupt more. Um, but also just the getting to clinic. You know, especially here at UNC, we have people that come from the Outer Banks to, you know, close to the mountains. And that's, you know, that's a three, four hour drive each way. And with gas money, that's not cheap. And if you got to stay in a hotel, um, one person has to stop working for a while. That really hurts the family. The other person has to stay home to watch the kids or help out. Um, it's a financial um, strain for certainly the majority of our patients. And for some of them, it's, it's a significant one. And in some cases, can even be a barrier to people receiving the treatment that they need. And we work to, uh, with our group, try to work to eliminate that. Um, and certainly there are some programs, and we have a financial assistance coordinator who can help with that, but um, it's a real problem. All right, more um, existential, spiritual, those two kind of run together a little bit, but certainly not the same. Um, someone at the very beginning said, you know, am I gonna die from this? And that's it, right? Existential, am I going to exist after this? Um, and that's at at least part of just about everyone's cancer experience. Um, whether the prognosis is, is encouraging or troubling, um, I think for most people when you hear the word cancer, before the doctor even kind of finishes saying you know, what they have to say or explaining the, the prognosis, one of the first associations you have is death. Um, and then kind of with that is kind of, you know, what do I want to do with my life, right? There's a lot of kind of meaning, you know, this can kind of, going through cancer can shake things up a little bit, right? And going through a traumatic experience may not leave you the same on the other side of that. And sometimes we think of that as a, as a negative, say, with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. But sometimes, and I've seen it certainly, it can actually lead to a lot of personal growth because you start questioning kind of what's important to you, what matters to you. Um, who's important to you, who matters to you, and to what degree you feel like maybe you were kind of spinning your wheels or not really doing what you wanted to with your life beforehand. Um, once your life has been threatened and your health has been, uh, you know, kind of broken down, those, um, those questions take on a little added importance and you don't kind of have the assumption that you're going to live to be 80. That, that doesn't feel as secure and some people want to change the way they live their life after that and that's, that's not uncommon. Um, we'll go down to the why me. Uh, I certainly hear that a lot. I hear it a lot with adolescents. Um, and it's usually a good question that doesn't really have a good answer, right? So why did I get leukemia? Why did I get breast cancer? Sometimes there's a genetic cause. Perhaps there's an environmental one, but usually there's nothing to really kind of pinpoint. Um, you know, it's very rare that I have the person who gets lung cancer after smoking five packs of cigarettes, um, you know, for 50 years. Um, rarely is there kind of that kind of cause and effect, you know, assumption in these. So uh, certainly why me is a big question. Um, grief and loss, I saw a lot of grief at the very beginning. And we think of grief as something we lose, something we do after we lose a person to, you know, a person dies. But certainly we grieve all kinds of things. And we grieve, uh, think of what you might lose in, in this situation with the cancer, you lose kind of your assumed health. You lose the thought that you're going to be healthy until you're old, maybe. You lose the security that comes with all that. You kind of lose the uh, kind of assumed trajectory that you thought you were on. You lose money. You might lose relationships. 
Um, there's a lot of loss, and with that can come a lot of grief. Um, and then death and dying at the very end, that's a, a, obviously a whole other talk in of itself. Um, but uh, while most of our patients survive, certainly not all of them do. All right, therapeutic approaches. Basically, what do we do, what do I do, um, here at the hospital to, uh, to work with these patients and help them through some of these psychological issues and struggles? Uh, so what I, and I'm part of the Comprehensive Cancer Support Program here at UNC, and so it's, um, we have uh, counselors, we have social workers, we have uh, several psychiatrists, I'm a psychologist, um, I mentioned the financial assistance coordinator, we have people that are partnered with us, nutritionists, massage therapists, um, you know, we're all available to our patients and we're fortunate and blessed to have a lot of good resources. Um, but I can speak more, of course, to what I do, um, and that is a lot of individual psychotherapy. Um, and I meet with people sometimes within the first several days of their diagnosis. Sometimes people don't come to our doorstep until, um, you know, until they transition into survivorship, uh, and some even during survivorship. But certainly psychotherapy to address either depression, anxiety, um, or any of the kind of myriad of emotional or psychological struggles that come with that is the primary uh, mode of delivery of services, at least for me. We run several support groups here at the hospital, and certainly you can look online and find a lot more. Um, support groups can be great in a lot of ways. They, you know, sometimes part of the, you know, what's so hard of this is feeling like you're the only one going through it and feeling there's no one else like you and there's no one else out there who knows what you're going through. And inevitably, someone in your world is going to say, you know, oh, I know what it's like because I once had a, you know, cousin who died from cancer and people understand they get offended by that and think you don't, you, know, you can't know what this is like. Um, support groups are different because everyone's in the same boat or at least kind of in the, close to the same boat. Um, they're also hard to get going. I'll, I'll, I'll cop to that. Everyone thinks they sound good and, and most people kind of want to do them, but when it comes down to it, either coming back to the hospital on a day that you are not already scheduled to be here or whether it's the kind of social fear of kind of disclosing and opening yourself up, um, support groups uh, don't have a great, at least my experience, don't have a great kind of success rate. But when they hit, when you get it going, they can be really great. Um, psychopharmacology at the very bottom or toward the bottom, that's uh, out of my wheelhouse. But um, certainly a lot of our patients are on antidepressants or anxiolytics for anxiety. Um, and I don't know the rates, but it's... It's not uncommon, and certainly a healthy portion of the people that I see for therapy um, are also taking medications. Um, I won't get into all of these kind of different types of psychotherapy uh, approaches, but you see at the very bottom, I um, italicize the word normalize. I think if there is kind of one if there is one, you know, kind of thing that I offer more regularly and that is more helpful to the patients that I see, it's to normalize for them what they're going through when it's appropriate, when I do find it to be within the bounds of, of normal, which it usually is. Um, you know, you're thrown, you know, the cancer diagnosis and everything can feel different and new and you're not sure how to act or what you're supposed to do or how you're supposed to feel or should you be hopeful or not and and people get kind of thrown off you don't feel like yourself and so if I talk with someone and I kind of pick up on that which I often do um, some of the feedback I'll give beginning in that first session is to normalize for them what they're going through tell them that what they're telling me is what I see often um, that it doesn't mean that they're um, you know, psychologically damaged or weak or, you know, vulnerable to the point that they're going to break, um, but really kind of normalize for them, completely normalize for them when it's appropriate, what they're going through. Uh, it seems to be some of the, uh, you know, kind of in the moment, the biggest relief that I see and can serve as a basis for psychotherapy. So say um, I see someone for anxiety, I, we may need to work on anxiety, that's why I'm seeing them, but I can normalize for, for him or her a lot of what he or she's going through otherwise. Um, so that's kind of the, you know, kind of the biggest thing that I, I think is kind of a, 
thread through a lot of my work and a lot of these different kind of psychotherapy approaches. Coping strategy. I mentioned the sweet spot earlier, and you see that up here. So that's kind of finding a realistic optimism, right? So you don't, it doesn't help you to be blindly optimistic, and it certainly doesn't help you to be blindly pessimistic. So you want to kind of have a center of the target be what is realistic toward optimism. So um, if someone, you know, I'm thinking here of kind of prog prognosis, if someone has a challenging prognosis, but but there is a cure, or there is a, a path toward cure, then it, it's good to be realistic about kind of your situation, but also be optimistic that, you know, the path that you're going through can work uh, and can lead to where you, you know, you want to go. You're not taking this chemotherapy for nothing and the doctors aren't prescribing it to you for nothing. Um, identifying what can be controlled and what cannot. Um, that's easier said than done. Um, but try and focus on what's within your control, trying to change those factors and those things that are not within your control, try and accept those for what they are. Um, again, it sounds like a nice principle, and it is a nice principle, uh, much you know, harder to kind of put, in, put into play given some of the things that sometimes you can't control. Um, here's one of the things, the very bottom one there, psychoeducation. So this is for a lot of my patients, what I'll do at the very beginning is kind of break down how they're doing and their psycho, psychological functioning into those three things you see. Their thoughts, their emotions, and their behaviors, right? So how you think, how you feel, and how you act. And those three things are usually the targets of our interventions, right? So can we work on how you think about this? Can we work on how you're feeling about this? Can we work on how you're, work on how you're behaving in response to this? Um, it's much harder to say, uh, let's feel differently. So usually we start with, are there ways to think about it differently? And are there ways to behave differently? Um, and a lot of that sometimes comes down to behaving in ways that you would normally behave. You know, cancer can be a life altering, often is a life uh, altering phenomenon, but it doesn't have to, you don't have to end your existence. You don't have to cut off ties with your friends. You don't have to sit in bed all day usually, you don't have to do it, you know, some of these things you can still do and you can still act and you can still be worthwhile and you can still do all those things and encouraging and helping patients and finding ways to, to do that is um, often the center of what I do. Um, all right, ah. uh, all right, so identify support networks, I know these kind of quickly, um, support networks, family, friends, community, church, um, there are a lot of cancer specific organizations out there. Um, open and mutual communication, certainly for the relationships, we try and encourage that. Um, you know, just because you're seeing a therapist, that doesn't, that shouldn't be the only time that you're, you know, talking about these things and kind of processing your emotions. Um, spiritual assistance, we have, um, a lot of great chaplains, uh, that work here at the hospital. I think most places have that. And again, kind of maintain normal when possible, easier said than done. Um, and this is a whole other, we probably don't need to go into this. This is just kind of a quick um, kind of thing if we had time to go over parenting with cancer, which I mentioned is a niche, but I see we're running up on the 12th we, we, or one forty five. Yeah, we've got a few more minutes. If, yeah? if you want to okay. touch on this, I think that would be All great. Right. Um, so if you have a parent or if you are a parent and uh, you have a child and you're trying to either kind of raise that, raise that child with cancer and, and figure out how best to do it in a way that doesn't disrupt that child's life too much and that doesn't um, scare or frighten that child unnecessarily. These are some of the things that, uh, quickly, that I kind of go over with parents. Um, two main things at home that if parents can feel like they can keep uh, on top of that is, is best, and that's maintain uh, structure, stability, and that's usually through either not changing your discipline uh, you know, strategies too much, you know, still kind of staying firm with those. Don't let kids get away with everything now just because you have cancer and, uh, you know, certainly don't be overly strict. And then be a, a, be warm, be emotionally available. So you can be those two things, maintain discipline and be emotionally available to your kids. You're going to be most of the way there. Uh, always, in, always encourage honesty with children and talking about um, diagnosis that and uh, things related to your cancer, that's not a, um, a hard and fast rule. Certainly there's some things you don't want to share with children, 
Uh, but kind of what I'll tell parents is, you know, kind of like when you see someone get sworn in, if you've ever been sworn in on, you know, to provide testimony in a court of law, you know, I swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, and the whole truth. So it's kind of like that with honesty. Um, be honest. Make sure whatever you say is honest. The whole honesty part, you don't have to do that, right? You can equivocate on how much you want to disclose, and certainly when that comes to prognosis. Uh, but honesty is the way to go. Uh, kids usually find out anyway, and if you can tell them yourself, you can control the message. And kids will trust that you are being honest with them. Um, your actions and your explanations about your um, cancer care and about your, you know, kind of where you are should match with your care goals. So if you're, um, if you're talking with your children about that, that you can, you know, that you can beat this and that you can, you know, be healthy again and get back to normal, that should match up largely with kind of what your treatment goals are and what your treatment path is at least hoped for. Again, that kind of goes back to being honest with kids. Um, welcome questions, discussions. I'll tell parents this isn't a one-time discussion. It's an ongoing conversation, and kids, depending on how old they are or their personalities, may ask or think of different questions at different times or may feel like being open with you about their own thoughts and feelings at different times. Um, and so that I put it there, the mad, sad, happy, glad game. I'll recommend this to just about every parent I work with who has a kid under the age of maybe eight or nine. Um, and that's to lay down with them at night when they tuck them in for bed, um, lay down at, you know, beside them in bed and play this game and both the, say in this case, the dad and the kid play. And you take turns saying something that made you mad that day and something that made you sad that day, something that made you happy that day. And what this can do is it can, as the parent, you can model for children how to talk about emotions and it's also a non-threatening way for kids to talk about their own emotions without being asked, you know, you know, kind of, how are you doing? Most kids kind of shut down. So at some point, the kid will say, you know, usually it's just kind of run-of-the-mill stuff, like I'm mad because I got someone cut me off in the lunch line at school. And the dad might say, oh, I got mad because someone cut me off in traffic. Same kind of thing. But at some point, the kid will say, well, it made me sad when... Um, when I when I look at you and you don't have any hair, and then the dad can say, "Well, tell me about that," and that's your opening for a conversation. Um, sometimes some of the most rich conversations are either laying in bed or driving in a car. I think because you're not looking someone face to face; you're either looking up at the ceiling or looking ahead of the road. Um, and I also encourage patients or parents always to kind of give themselves a break. Um, they don't have to be perfect parents just because they have cancer. They probably were not perfect before, they certainly don't have to be perfect now. All right, and let me, let me ask about that. So kids are so egocentric by nature. Um, do we see a, 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 a particular concern with children trying to take on some of the burden or, or cause of that cancer, and is there anything that we can do to, to help uh, counteract that? So what it comes down for, for parents is communication, communication, mm -hmm. communication, mm -hmm. um, you know, talk with your kids and that's where, um, it, you know, we, some of this comes up and that you, it's hard to know what your kids are thinking. <laughs> Whether you have cancer or not, I, I can tell you probably can't yeah, tell. I, it's, yeah. yeah, it's hard to know what your kids are thinking. So mm -hmm. I had this one case, I always go back to some example mm -hmm. where a parent was getting bone marrow, getting a bone marrow transplant and the child was maybe seven or eight years old and was just freaking out about their parent having a bone marrow transplant much more than we would expect this child would have. And mm -hmm. he wasn't necessarily an anxious child, but he was really anxious and we couldn't figure out kind of why. And only because, and he wouldn't tell us really, and it was, it was kind of hard to break through, only because the parents continued to talk to him and talk about it did it finally come out that there was a misunderstanding, that he thought, he thought his parent was getting a bone transplant, which in his little mind meant they were taking out all the bones of his parent and putting in all new bones. And that seemed like a horrific, so that never would have come out without kind of communication. Right. Um, so that's, and certainly kids can take on their own responsibility. They can think that they need to do more around the house or can sometimes maybe think that, but end up, you know, causing more havoc around the house. And really it comes down to communication, 
maintaining disciplinary boundaries and being emotionally available to your child. If you can kind of hit those things and give yourself a break when you don't, mm -hmm. you're going to be okay. Okay. Well, let's, let's take a look and see what our uh, audience has in terms of questions. Um, all right, so none that have come in yet. So uh, now is your chance. Uh, you, you've heard a lot of phenomenal information from Dr. Yap over the last 50 minutes or so. So please go ahead and start sending us your questions. Again, if you didn't do the poll at the beginning, uh, just one time, UNCCN to the number 22333, we'll take care of that, uh, or pollev.com forward slash UNCCN. So what are some of the techniques you use to talk with children to talk with children with cancer? It's a good question. So that depends somewhat on the age, of course, whether it's a young child or, say, an adolescent. Um, I'd say, to start with adolescents, the, the biggest technique I have is, again, to kind of normalize kind of what I imagine they're experiencing because I don't hear. Sometimes we get adolescents who are very kind of verbal and vocal and open about what they're going through, but a lot of times you don't. Um, and so you have to kind of say, um, well, you know what, what? What I often hear is this, X, Y, or Z, or that people say that they're kind of worried that their friends might think about them differently. And um, either the adolescent will kind of nod or give me a no, and that's how I kind of have to like, go through the checklist of what I imagine they might be thinking. And that's why they, how they can communicate to me whether that's what they're thinking or not. And if it is what they're thinking, then that kind of normalizes it because I, I could anticipate what they're, what they're thinking even ahead of time, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I say, um, you know, kids, you know, I bet you're worried. or I hear a lot of kids tell me that, um, you know, that they're worried that, that they may never be the same again or that they may... You know, they may never get better. And they kind of nod your head. Then just by saying that, and then I can say, well, you know, the reason why I could I could kind of guess that is because I hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. And then right then it's kind of normalizing. Mm -hmm. um, certainly with young kids, there's some play involved. I'm not I'm not really big on using kind of toys or things like that, but certainly some play and kind of playing while you're talking. Certainly have kind of chemo doll or dolls you can kind of explain where the chemo goes in and all that. There's some very kind of basic teaching um, that our child life does a great job with. Um, those are some of the quick great. Of the great. Of nine techniques. Now, that's great. Now, I, I'm going to have to, to stop and say kudos because we have a problem that we've just about never had before, <laughs> and that speaks to, to what a great audience you are. You have filled up the board with questions yeah, to the really point where I can't get to the ones at the bottom. So what we're going to do is we're going to work backwards, and I'm going to ask my colleague, Alan Brown, to uh, please text to my phone some of those earlier questions so that I can grab those. Uh, you all are amazing because, because usually the questions are, we have fewer questions fewer and they questions. don't come in as quickly. So this is great. Thank you all. Alan, if you can please go ahead and text some of those to my phone, then I'll come back to some of those and we'll work our way backwards. Uh, that, that one I thought was a, a, a lot of great questions. Let me start with that. Is a PhD a prerequisite for working in the field? No, you can be. We, one of my colleagues is a master's level uh, counselor and she mm -hmm. does. Um, we do a little bit different things, but as far as our work with patients, uh, we do largely the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go just suggestion. If you go into psychology, um, a master's level, at least North Carolina, a master's level psychologist um, still has to be kind of supervised by a PhD psychologist and it kind of puts a cap on where you can go. If you can be a master's level clinical social worker or go into a master's level counseling program, uh, that's better. Um, and certainly we have those people that work in our, in our field. So the strict answer is no, a PhD is not a, uh, an automatic prerequisite. Okay. And, of course, there are many, many fields that are involved with oncology. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, as, as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I mean, there's, yeah, whether you want to be a nutritionist or a massage therapist or whatever, but if you want to, I'm just thinking of doing uh, kind of psychotherapy with patients, yeah. you don't have to have a PhD. But if you go into psychology, get a PhD, don't get a master's in psychology. Yeah. I would not defend any master's level psychologist. All right. Because <laughs> they're great. My mom's one, but that was the advice she gave me. 
All right. Uh, can you explain this? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Per permanent, <laughs> permanent head damage. God, I, I, maybe. Um, I like that. Uh, can you explain the dual process model? And, and I know, I know yeah. you, you mentioned that earlier, and I don't know how, you know, it may take obviously more time to get yeah. into all of it than we have here. So but. it's developed by two um, psychologists, researchers in the Netherlands um, named Margaret Strobe and Hank Schutt. And they first published it on it, I think, in 1999. And what it does is it doesn't tell you which emotions you're supposed to have, and it doesn't give you any stages or any kind of you know, stepwise progression because that's not how it works. It's not how grief works, really. So what it does is it looks at the dual. The two things that it kind of focuses on are either loss-oriented stressors. Basically, that's what you've lost, whether you've lost your independence, you've lost a loved one, you've lost an imagined future, um, you're yearning for the person, kind of what we think of as grief, missing the person, um, you know, not being willing to take off your wedding ring if you lose your spouse, and then there's the restoration-oriented stressors, which are stressors and things in your life that are different and that are difficult because of the loss. And so that's, um, you know, I've worked a lot with widowed parents. So in that case, a kind of restoration-oriented stressor would be, um, you know, how do I figure out how to cook dinner because my husband cooked all the dinner beforehand, or... I need to figure out, you know, whether I want to, you know, date again, or I need to figure out um, how to manage the home, or I need to kind of figure out all these things about how to restore your life moving forward. So it's kind of the looking back and the moving forward. And our attention oscillates between those two things, right? Sometimes we look back, sometimes we need to look forward, and you can't do just one or the other, right? If you just look back all the time, then you get stuck in your grief. If you just look forward without kind of processing what happened, then that's still there. So it takes some oscillation going back and forth. And over time, the hope, if you're able to kind of cope with these stressors effectively, is that the time spent looking back will be less and less, and the time being looking forward will be restorative, restorative, and that will kind of develop into your new life. So it's kind of those two things, looking back, moving forward, and your ping-ponging attention between those two, and that's what can be so disorienting about grief, is that you're looking back and moving forward, you have to do both at once, but you can't, and then it can be overwhelming. Um, that's a uh, quick, quick explanation. But, yeah, the dual process model of coping and bereavement. Um, there's a 1999 and a 2010 articles that are the best I would, I would definitely recommend. Great. Well, we'll hope that our audience looks those up. Uh, boy, I don't know that we'll get to all of them. Um, yeah, let's see, what has been the hardest thing for you to overcome working with people mm. diagnosed with cancer? Um, probably with working with kids. Mm. Um, I have kids of my own, and um, you know, sometimes I'll work with a patient that will remind me of whatever reason uh, as a, you know, one of my own kids, and um, that's a little hard. You, you, you kind of get used, at least I've kind of gotten used to it for the most part. Mm. Um, I think like in most jobs, you do it long enough and you, it, you know, you, you, you kind of just get used to the emotionally difficult aspects for the most part. But then as you can imagine, um, certainly have patients that die and, um, you know, the ones you get close to are the ones that you get close to their family members and, um, either knowing when they're going to die and then certainly, you know, when they do and after they do is, uh, it's tough, and you know, certainly we see a lot of people who end up having, you know, what you might call like a good death, where they um, prepared for it and felt as ready as they could, and things were like, and then you have some where that doesn't unfold like that, and it feels, uh, it feels messy and more incomplete than normal, and sometimes, you know, either despite our best efforts or because it's hard to know what to do for sometimes for some families. Um, Sometimes you walk away from those feeling like you either could have done better or wishing it would have gone better uh, for the families and those can leave a bad taste in your mouth. Yeah. Okay. We, I hate, I hate to not get to all the other questions, but we should probably go ahead and wrap up. Um, 
I, I will say that, that uh, we have a phenomenal set of resources in our, in our library. We have about two, mm -hmm. almost 200 different oncology-related videos, uh, some mm -hmm. other ones including some that will touch on different issues uh, around, around psychosocial uh, areas. So, so I encourage everyone to look at those. I encourage you to uh, tell us about lectures that you'd be interested in in the future. Uh, I, want to, I want to say a quick thank you to, uh, to all of our different folks who make this possible, the, uh, General, the North Carolina General Assembly and their generous support of the UC, what we call the UCRF or University Cancer Research Fund, to the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, to North Carolina Community Colleges, um, and as specifically to Renee Batts and, and Kathy Davis for all the great work that they've done in, in coordination with this program. We want to thank our team, uh, Dr. Tom Shea, Mary King, Veneranda Ogore, Alan Brown, and Jean Sellers for all the phenomenal work they do to make this possible. We hope that you will join us again on November 27th at 1 p.m. for end-of-life care options for patients with cancer. And that's with uh, Dr. Christine Kistler. And so she'll be here. If you like this lecture and would like to share it, we will have it on video. It should be out in the next day or two. You can go to uncn.org, find our lecture library. It will be there along with other community college lectures and a variety of other oncology lectures. And for this one on the 27th, mm -hmm. uh, Chrissy's great. And she's got a wealth of knowledge and is, is really good at communicating it. So... I may have to find a way to watch that. Great, great. <laughs> we are looking forward to that. Uh, www.unccn.org, End of Life Care, for more information on that lecture and our site. You can receive our newsletter, look at all the events coming up, lots of information there. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Until next time. And Dr. Yop, thank okay. you. It's been an Thanks. honor. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Glad to have you here. All right. All right.